Okay. For we just continue from where we stopped. Where the covenant? We are looking at the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. So here we find that courtship is over and God is making his final proposal. That is like in a marriage, courtship is over. Now we want what? Maybe engagement. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy uh, purports to be Moses' final oration and then functions as prologue to the collection of Joshua. In other words, this book functions as if it is putting a foundation or laying a foundation for the book of Joshua, Judges, 2 Samuel, 1 or 2 Kings, called the Deuteronomic History. And this book fits the description of the law book found in 622 during the reign of Josiah when they were um, they were trying to do reformation on the temple and has a lot of influence on basic ideas in the prophetic and historical book. So this book of Deuteronomy is very important. We see now the living voices of Moses. The book of Deuteronomy appears to be a series of addresses given by Moses to the Israelites on the plains of Moab and shortly before entering the promised land. Moses' words are relevant to God's people through all ages. The words uttered by Moses you find that every other time through the generation, they are still as good. So Deuteronomy can be referred to as the living voice of Moses, speaking the word of God even they walking the way. Moses makes it clear that following the law is a way of life, following the law of the Lord. This would ensure long life and prosperity. In other words, the Jews are told that, you know, if you obey the law, you stay on the land for a long time and you will be secure. Similarly, Jesus called, calls for single-minded discipleship in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He reminds them of God's salvation, protection, feeding and leading them through the wilderness. They are to remember God as the author of all wealth. You know, the consequences of the covenant. Moses warns the Israelites of the consequences of refusing to listen to the voice of law of the Lord, yet leaves one door to restore the covenant that is repentance. In other words, if the Israelites refuse to listen to the voice of God, they will be punished. But still leaves a, a, a door of repentance. Deuteronomy chapter 30 gives us everlasting hope of God's protection and providence to the Israelites. He would gather them when scattered and bless them again. Another in Deuteronomy saying, no, when my people sin against me, they will be scattered in different countries. But when they come back to their senses and repent, God would gather them and bring them back to their promised land. Witnesses of the covenant. Yeah, in the ancient Near East, Witnessing was and is still the guarantee to a covenant or agreement in many cultures. In pagan treaties, gods of both nations were summoned to guarantee faithfulness to the covenant. God leaves a powerful prophetic witness in the song of Moses because after that we see Moses coming up with a song which is actually very important even today. Then let us look at um, Moses' last will and testament. A will is what a father leaves for his children. So Moses sums up his life's work in the Solomon warning in chapter 32. Chapter 34 is about the death of Moses at Mount Nebo at 120 years. It describes him as the greatest prophet who spoke to God face to face but still meek. In other words, he's still meek even when he Talks to God. Meek means he's humble. Because many people, when they get anything to serve the Lord, they puff up, they feel big. Maybe you have been made a chaplain, or you have been even chairperson of scripture union, you know, or even chief warden. You are supposed to remain meek. You are supposed to remain humble. That's what Moses did. He was and is an amazing role model for prophets and ministers who follow him. Now, we want to look at the book of Joshua, setting up a home. 
because finally Joshua who took over from Moses is the one who led the Jews through to the promised land and even participates in having it divided up. Okay, this brings us to the fulfilled promise God made to Abraham 760 years before. Previously, under the patriarchs, all the burial places had been secured, but now Israel enters Canaan and each tribe is allocated land. The entry to the land again shows how God is fully evolved to bring his promises come true. And it involves eh, three virtues. Uh, Joshua takes over from Moses. Promises are reiterated and charged not to turn away from the law. In other words, we see when Moses, Joshua is being uh, is taking over, as we see Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, that he is charged not to move away to turn to the right or the left from the law. And then we see Joshua sends spies to Jericho. Nearly, they, are, they are nearly captured, but were saved by prostitute called Rahab, remembered for her great faith. Then we also see a miracle at River Jordan, where water piled up, then a monument of 12 stones is put up. That's very important. Now, we we'll look at the miracle at the Jordan River, the water piling up. Uh, flooded Jordan is made dry ground for the Israelites to cross. You know, and that is not an ordinary thing. Water just piles up and dries up. And then when it happened, priests carried the Ark of the Covenant by stepping in the middle of the river. The river piles up streams, creating a dry path. Twelve stones were collected by the twelve tribal leaders representing the twelve tribes of Israel and are made into a monument to remind the future generation of what God did for their fathers. So that for generation, this is as we always remember that at one time when they were crossing, their parents were crossing, the river became dry. Then we find spiritual warfare at Jericho and I. Jericho falls before the Israelites without using any arms. God delivers according to his promise that he will fight for them. If you read in the Bible, you find that uh, this city here, the Jews were told just to run around the city and the gate just broke and fell down and they are able to overtake the town. Then we see Rahab is used by God to confirm to the Israelites how they are feared and hides the spies from the people of Jericho. In other words, by this lady hiding them, it means even the people of Jericho were fearing. She is promised safety when they come to destroy Jericho. No, uh, now next we can look at uh, the land distribution. Um, it's important, of course, on my map here, there are two. One is showing the important tribes. That is the one on the right side. Then on the left side, we want to see the map of the ancient Near East. Uh, of course, we only look at the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea. Then we see Dead Sea. From Dead Sea, we have that river called River Jordan. And, uh, of course, River Jordan is flowing from Lake Galilee. And you can see um, uh, we don't have contours to explain this properly. But on the coastal plains, to just help to understand that these are lowlands near the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Then as you come up, you see what we call foothills. That is the bottom, the bottom of the hill. From the bottom, of course, you come to the hill country. And then from the hill country, you're able next to come to River Jordan. It has a valley there. And so that's the river. But then on the other side, we're going to look at the main tribes. You know, the tribes can be many, just like in Uganda, have many tribes. But there are tribes which are very famous or which are very common. Uh, you topographic strips, coastal plains were occupied by the Philistines. That is near maintenance immediately. And then foothills is distributed between the Philistines and the Israelites. They are always fighting for those foothills. Who ends there? They didn't have international boundaries like we do at the moment. Then we have the hill country occupied by Israelites. Then we have the Jordan Valley sparsely populated. Then Transjordan regions. We have Bashan, uh, Manasseh East. You know, we have the Manasseh, we have Gilead, 
are Bashan, Gilid, Moab, Edom. Uh, Bashan is occupied by the Manasseh, then Gilid by the God, then Moab is disputed between the kingdom of Moab and Israel. Moab, of course, you see, is towards the Dead Sea, and finally Edom is actually the kingdom of Edom, as you can see on this left map. But then when we come on the right side, we're going to see the main, uh, all famous, uh, most pronounced tribes, the tribes of Manasseh, they had the headquarter at Shechem. Then we have Ephraim, at Shiphon, and then Benjamin at Bethel, and Judah at Hebron. And of course, as we go on, you find that um, David was coming from the tribe of Judah. His capital started from Hebron. So, that is already mentioned, Manasseh, Shechem, Ephraim, Shiloh, Benjamin, Bethel, and Judah, Hebron. And of course, as we move on, these places will be mentioned so much, especially when we talk about Shiloh, and uh, we'll be talking about more. Okay, now, conquest or settlement. Um, historians um, emphasize that the conquest was complex and gradual. That is between 1200 to 1000 BC. And I want you to remember that uh, BC counts downwards. All the Canaanites were not completely driven out of the land. That's why we hear of the Kabites, the Edomites. In other words, it should be important for pe people to understand that not all tribes were removed completely, but others remained there. Because with time, we shall come to hear of tribes called the Edomites, the Rechabites, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, also, the book of Joshua tells us that each tribe received a land portion as God had promised each tribe except the tribe of the Levites God for them they are to serve on God's temple and they are scattered everywhere okay renewing the covenant you see that before Joshua hands over or disappears from the scene there is issue of reminding the covenant renewing Joshua reminds the people that God chose them protected and delivered them to the land flowing with milk and honey. He told them of the obligation to the covenant. That is in chapter 24. Israelites are challenged to do away with idols, then set up a monument of stone as a witness to the new covenant. Words, when Joshua helped these people to renew their commitment, he put up a monument which will remind their children forever for just generations that when they settled in the place, they renew the covenant that they, they will serve the Lord only. And there's a famous verse in chapter 24 that uh, decide today whom you will serve. Are you serving Baal or are you serving God? But the cho people decided and said all together that they serve the Lord. Okay. Key theological themes from Joshua's work. The main theological themes we derive from the work of Joshua. That is one is salvation is by grace, verses 1 to 13. See, the Lord recites the history of his saving acts, linking the promise of Abraham with land, eh, possession. In other words, he saw that the salvation was by grace. They didn't deserve it. Good on his own, just promised them, you get to Abraham, you get all this. And then he talks about conversion as a main theme also. In verse 20, 14 to 24, we find that Joshua calls on the people to renounce gods of Baal and serve only God. That is conversion. In other words, we are reminded that God saved us by his grace. But saving us by his grace means we should be converted. And then when that is done, they are sealing the covenant. Joshua sets a monument to seal the covenant. That is in 25 to 27. That is sealing the covenant. Okay, now uh, we want to look at the new covenant in the days of Jesus. The old covenant was modeled on royal treaties. The death of Moses and Joshua was farewell, but did not make the covenants effective. So it awaited for a more superior death to see the covenant of Jesus Christ as once and for all. In other words, uh, the old covenants were there and they are modeling it on the, on the regiment from uh, the royal treaties at that time you know but we see that Moses and Joshua die but when they die the covenants are still not effective they are not accomplished 
And so, even as they had them over, it's as if there's something in waiting. So it was waiting for a more superior death, which would fear, which would seal the covenant. That is the one of Jesus Christ, which seals it once and for all. So we see Christ becomes the mediator of the new covenant. He is the high priest. The New Testament is the high priest because he entered the Hall of Holies not on the account of animal blood or sacrifices because in the Old Covenant they would have blood of animals and then the high priest would enter there. But Jesus entered there based on his own blood becoming sufficient and final sacrifice for man's salvation. Christ was both a high priest and the sacrifice because there is no sacrifice which would fit and we could not have any better high priest than Jesus himself. Thank you very much uh, for attending. And I want us to end by thanking God. God, thank you very much for today and for this lecture. We pray that, Lord, you be with us and be able to help us as you convict us to continue serving you. God bless you.